Hello, Mr. Cropper. I am back here with the Plato debate. I uh, unfortunately didn't get around to this before because uh, stuff came up and then I kind of forgot, but I'm back to it now. As you guys might have noticed, uh, I'm not using my camera, and that's because it is currently having some technical difficulties, and so I'm going to use PowerPoint instead, which is actually fine because I like to show some stuff on here anyway. So, Well, let's get on with uh, the Plato debate without any further ado. Okay, the first... Uh, criticism you make here about my view is that at, uh, let's see, 149 you say, for him to think that things refer, refer to reality is very difficult and that's going to be a problem for him at 413. The idea, of course, being that the physical world corresponds to physical stuff and that there's an extra platonic world that's somehow outside of it or disconnected to it that you know, when I refer to things in the platonic realm, I'm not referring things to the physical realm, and so there's a, a disconnect or a dualistic dichotomy. Uh, this is actually the hardest problem for my position, and once I get past this, the rest is going to be pretty easy, but I have a rather unusual way of addressing this. I mentioned before, way back at the beginning of the debate in my first video, that I also have some additional views regarding metaphysics and ontology, which may come in to the debate, and that entails right here, actually. So how do I solve this? Uh, to explain this, I'm going to look at metaphysics for a second here, and I'm going to list off three possible options and show you which one is the only possible one. The first possibility is that essence precedes existence. But of course this is impossible because if essence precedes existence, it would be outside of existence and so therefore would by definition not exist. The second possibility is that existence precedes essence. But the problem with this is, is you know, if something exists, it has to exist as something. It has to have an identity to it or a... it has to fit some kind of a form, so to speak. Like, there's, you know, plants outside, there has to be a, a you know, something we can refer to as a plant before we can specify X as a plant, right? So it has to be a something. Of course, you know, a plant is a derived thing, but let's maybe break it down to a more fundamental f um, property, like mass or something. That's a, a specific intrinsic property that's there that everything that has mass partakes in, essentially. If it doesn't have this identity, though, well, then it doesn't exist. It doesn't exist as anything. But now the problem is, is that essence is platonic in nature. So the problem here is now, you know, since something can exist without an essence, number two is impossible either, and so therefore existence cannot precede essence. The remaining option we have left is that existence is essence. You know, we've, we've demonstrated that essence cannot precede existence. We've demonstrated that existence cannot precede essence, and so the only remaining option, however, strange this is, is that existence is just essence, which, as bizarre as it's going to sound, it means that all of reality is essentially platonic in nature. Now, of course, you're going to wonder well, how that makes any sense. Well, let me make a demonstration here. All right, so what do you see? You see a bunch of raspberries, right? And on the raspberries, you see the phenomenal sensation of redness, okay? Now, obviously, it's not actually red out there. All red is how your brain interprets it, but the point is, is that your mental interpretation of it, your thought of redness, is an intrinsic thing, which just is. It's not material per se, but you can obviously see that it's there. It's, you know, no one's going to deny that they have a subjective sensation of red. But now the point is, is that to get around substance dualism, we have to logically conclude that whatever is, you know, the redness is, it's ontologically connected to, you know, the processes in your brain, which are ontologically connected to your eye, and then to the light, and then further to the raspberry itself. As such, all of reality would have to be made of the same sort of ontological substance that platonic forms are made out of, which is a little strange to think of at first, but it makes sense when you realize that well, ideas are primary, they have a intrinsic ex existence, and you know, if monism is true, this would mean that all of reality is also platonic in nature. Now, this doesn't imply mind dependence, per se, because obviously platonic forms can exist, well, if you don't, if you buy them, which you don't, but if you do buy them, uh, they exist intrinsically, they're not something you can change with your mind, you can't change 1 plus 1 equals 2 into 1 plus 1 equals 3 or anything like that, it's accessed with the mind, but it's not something you can change with the mind, so it's it still allows for objectivity. So getting back to this problem of how I can refer to things out in the physical world using platonic forms, well, that's really simple. I simply reduce the physical world to platonic forms, so whenever I refer to something external, I'm referring to platonic stuff or information. Of course, now you're probably going to have two reactions to this. Uh, first of all, you're probably going to balk at it somewhat, 
I'll get to that in a moment. But secondly, you're also going to ask, why do I then posit this extra category of knowledge if I can just, you know, if, I, if I'm positing that empirical knowledge is a kind of platonic knowledge or reduced to platonic knowledge, why do I bother having platonic knowledge as well? The answer is, is that, well, some knowledge is intrinsically empirical, other pieces of knowledge are not empirical. Uh, for example, the concept of the I, or the Cartesian ego, you know, I think, therefore I am, but I didn't need any empirical knowledge to figure that out. And if I could figure that out by just introspection without looking at the outside world, then I can also deduce that such a thing as knowledge exists, and therefore such a thing as truth exists. I can maybe then proceed from there and say, well, I have, I know three things now, but that means number three exists, so now I can deduce numbers as well. And so we have a, a body of a priori knowledge here, as well as a body of empirical knowledge, and the two are unified because they're both reduced to this platonic stuff. So no, referring to things in the outside world is not a problem for me now. I will mention that, uh, from your point of view, referring to such things as a Cartesian ego is a problem, though. Because you can't, that's something that's you think that all knowledge is from the outside world, well, that's an example of something that's not from the outside world. You can't explain that very well. Now, at this point, you're probably going to balk at the idea that the universe is fundamentally made up of something which is ontologically indistinguishable from ideas or information. However, as a matter of fact, this is actually uh, established physics now. I have uh, links of this in the description below. As it turns out, the uh, quantum information theory and the holographic principle are both showing us that the universe is actually made of quantum information, rather than actual physical stuff. Now, uh, I know a lot of people get very argumentative about this and refuse to get it, and it's, it's actually kind of cute. They, they behave very much like uh, flat Earth theories and so forth, but that's just how it is. If you don't accept that, that basically puts you in the same camp as a creationist. At 356 you say, well, what about things which cannot be demonstrated and you know? That is called ostensive or obsensible or sensory knowledge. Uh, two things. First of all, that's just a bare assertion. You just said that. You didn't give an argument for it, per se. And you gave, you gave examples of what sensory data was, but you didn't say you, you didn't argue for why this was primary knowledge. Secondly, this is not primary knowledge because you have to be able to demonstrate it. To do this, you need to solve what's known as the problem of induction, that is to demonstrate that you can actually trust your senses as to what's going on out in the real world. You know, you might be in the matrix, or a brain in a vat, or a, a dream, or a hallucination, or something. You don't know if what you actually observe immediately is true knowledge. You have to solve the problem of induction first to demonstrate that you can trust your senses to give you true knowledge. Okay, and in order to do that, you can't rely on anything out there because the out there is what you're trying to argue for, okay, which necessarily means that whatever solves the problem of induction has to be a priori. Now in my case, it turns out that uh, my metaphysics allows for the problem of induction to be solved quite quickly. I don't have to worry of whether it's, you know, fit, you know, some information construct are real because, well, it's all information constructs. It's I, I can trust it immediately because it's, whether it's a matrix or not, it's information all the way down, so I don't have to worry. And I know this a priori, so I don't, I'm not gonna, I don't have to go any farther than that. The next thing you do here is really quite crazy. I mean, you're, it's, uh, you, you contradict yourself, and you, you, it's basically the same statement, but it's said about nine different times all throughout the video. Let me read a couple of these here. 428, all knowledge is only and nothing but sensory data. 451, anything that is real knowledge is empirical data. Uh, 835, which needs a premise and so on, but not if you accept physical reality as the base of all knowledge. Uh, 13, there is no knowledge without empirical data. 1440, empirical data is nothing but knowledge. Uh, you saw it throughout here, and you, you just repeat this over and over again without justifying it, but the funny thing is, is that every one of these statements is actually itself an a priori statement. You couldn't possibly know this by looking at the uh, empirical domain, because all the empirical domain gives you is empirical data. It doesn't say anything one way or the other about anything that may or may not exist outside of the empirical domain. So it can't tell you whether they're a priori truths or not. But you're stating these all as a priori truths, so therefore you must have gotten this knowledge that all empir the empirical data is all knowledge there is, uh, somehow a priori, which then immediately contradicts your position because it means that you have some a priori knowledge that does not come from empirical data.
I'm going to go through the rest of what you said, but I really don't even see why we have to go farther with the uh, debate here. Uh, you've basically just contradicted your own, your, your entire position is one gargantuan self-contradiction. It doesn't need me to refute it, it, it refutes itself immediately. 